honor pastor, celebrate with them. 30 years is a long time. It's quite an accomplishment, and I'm so thankful for the example that they have been in all of our lives of of marriage. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 25, um, beginning in verse 7 today. I thank Pastor for the opportunity to preach. Don't take it lightly. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25, beginning in verse 7. But before that, I want to just mention something the Lord laid on my heart this morning. Um, It's really common for us to hold on to stuff. We call stuff ours all the time. I believe it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It says that God has given us everything. Nothing is really ours. We just hold on to stuff, white-knuckled. We won't let go of it. But God spoke to me this morning that what you hold on to constrains what he can do in your life and your situations. There are some things that we've been clinging to that have poisoned poisoned our minds and our hearts. And I think before we begin this morning, we just need to pray and ask God for, to help us let go of some things and to put them in his hands because he knows what you need. You don't know what you need. We pray, God, meet my need. We don't even really know what our need is. It could be deeper than we even understand. So let's just take a moment before we read this text and let's pray and ask God for help to just let go of some things this morning. Jesus, in your name, we thank you for your presence that's in this place. We thank you for your power and your anointing. God, release it in this house. Do a mighty work this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. God, whatever we've been holding on to, I pray that we would release it in Jesus' name. God, that you would begin to fill us. God, that you would flood in in our season of need and trouble. And we pray it today in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 7 says, And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, Mine husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of mine husband's brother. Verse 8, then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, so shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house to the man that will not build up his brother's house verse 10 and his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his shoe loosed the house of him that hath his shoe loosed you can be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning a lot of shoe brands. I think there's more shoe brands and advertisements than we've ever seen. There's Nike, Adidas, Jordan, Vans, Converse, Skechers, Asics. Some of our closets don't have any more space for new pairs of shoes. The global shoe market was valued at $365.5 billion last year. That's a lot of money to spend on shoes. The average American spends $419 per year on shoes. Some, dare I say, even in this room, much more than that. The average American man owns 12 pairs of shoes. And the average American woman owns 27 pairs of shoes. Is that low or high for you? 27, that is a lot of shoes. But how many pairs of feet do we have? One, right? Just one. Western society has just an abundance of stuff. And that abundance has caused shoes to be viewed much differently than they were 
in the Bible days. To the Jews, shoes were much different. They were not necessarily a symbol of social status like they are now. They didn't have Air Jordan 1s back in Jesus' day. He wasn't rocking the coolest new Kobe Bryant or LeBron James shoes. They were all about the same. Sandals. They were critical to to walking and to protecting the feet. But in some context, they were also viewed as unholy. In the presence of the Lord, when God visited Moses, he told him, take off your shoes for the the ground you are standing on is holy. And in Joshua 15.5, the angel The angel of hosts came to Joshua and said, Take off your sandals, for the ground that you're standing on is holy. God did not initially intend us to wear shoes. In the Garden of Eden, there were no shoes. They didn't need it. But when sin entered the world, so did thorns. And so did the the necessity for us to protect our feet. And it's important to protect our feet because... The feet represent the dominion that God has given us. Psalms 8 and 6 says that God has put everything under your feet. In Romans uh, 16, 20, it describes Satan being bruised under your feet. So your feet are important and important to protect. But the context of our text in Deuteronomy chapter 25 indicates that it was it was addressed to the general population not the priests the priests ministered without shoes on for the same reason that Joshua and Moses were required to take their their shoes off shoes were viewed as dirty or unholy in relation to the presence of the Lord but in a general sense they were significant they meant you had power and status. You had protection and possession. A Jewish proverb says, as long as thy feet are shod or covered, tread the thorn or go after it. Shoes protected feet from the harshness of the desert environment in which they lived. They also afforded a level of comfort while they walked. And walking was the primary means by which they were able to move around. There was no cars. There was no mass transit back then. You either walked or maybe you had a donkey. And that was it. To be without shoes was seen as weakness, inferiority, punishment. Fugitives were shoeless. Slaves were shoeless. Captives walked barefoot. David, king of Israel, fled from Absalom without shoes. The prophet Isaiah was called by God to walk without shoes for three years. Could you imagine how tough your feet would be if you had to walk without shoes for three years? As Jewish tradition holds, men typically only had one pair of shoes, and they usually wore them for about seven years. I don't know about you, but I don't think our shoes now would last that long. Seems like a couple years and they're, they're worthless. But they lasted typically seven years. They were so important. And women had a little bit more flexibility. They typically had a few pairs and could wear them different religious holidays. But they still only owned a few pairs. Shoes were so valuable that their exchange cemented the completion of important transactions. Can you imagine going to the gas station, paying for your gas, and the attendant hands you his Air Monarchs that he used to mow the lawn yesterday? It wouldn't fit in your wallet very nice, would it? it? Wouldn't be very pleasant in any sense, but... Our, our, pec, our text paints a, a much different picture. There is no receipt here. This is not a, a, a willing surrender of a shoe in, in exchange. However, the Bible says that when a man died and left no children for his wife, 
God required one of his brothers to marry his widow. And that, that's jarring to us today. It's weird and it's even repulsive. But back then it was normal. We understand that the letter or, or the ceremonial law is dead. But the principles behind the law are still alive and still well and still true. So if we consider this text in principle, what, what is God getting at? What does God want us to understand from this passage? What is he instructing us to do? Implicit in the text, the brother who was to marry the widow was to also care for the widow's family and household. It was their duty to guard, their duty to protect, to lift up, to help their brother's family in the time of need. And, and this was intentional. God intended for this to happen. It was supposed to be that way. But verse 7 makes it very clear that they were not forced to do this. They didn't have to take care of their brother, their brother's family. They had a choice, an option. They could either bear up their brother, bear their brother's burdens, or they could reject it. And the only way out of this duty was to allow the, the widow to gather the elders together in a very public, public setting. And the elders were to press the, the brother and ask him what he was going to do. If the brother chose to not bear up his brother's burdens, then the widow was to take off the sandal and spit in his face. How humiliating. How embarrassing. To be spit on in front of the, the, the nobles of your city. But not only that, the brother would also be marked by God. He would be given a new name. He would not be known by what he had done. He would not be known by the, by the love he had shown. Or by the, the, the way he had served God before. But he would only be known as the brother whose shoe was loosed. As the brother who chose to not love his brother and their family. What a tragic title that embodies the selfishness that we see today. Selfishness breeds instability. And that image is embodied in the picture of a man with one shoe. Have you ever tried to run with one shoe on? It's not very comfortable. Every step hurts. It puts pressure on all of your joints, all of your muscles and tendons, because you're out of balance. You're stumbling and wandering in circles. And this picture is such a, finishing, a, a, such a fitting punishment for those that choose to not love their brothers. And I know it's, it's not, it's, it's the principle behind it, not the, 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 letter, the letter of the law, but God definitely marks those that do not love their brothers. If you choose to not love your brother, God keeps good records. And we all face that choice every day. Will we invest in those around us? Will we put their interests ahead of ours? Will we turn to selfish ambitions and desires? Ask today the question, what are you going to do when your brother's house is in trouble? What are you going to do when someone that you love, when someone that's close to you is struggling, that they have no way out of their situation, they have no way forward? What are you going to do? Are you going to just stand there and watch them destruct? Are you going to stand there and let them die in their dilemma? Or are you going to reach out a hand of love and to reach out to them and say, I'm with you through this. I see where you're at. 
I, I am going through life intentionally. I am looking for my brother. I am looking for my sister. I am looking for their needs and their battles and their struggles. And I decide to bear their burdens. Our culture today promotes selfishness. YouTube, where you're important. Nobody else is. If you scroll through any social media feed, most of their posts and stuff are about what? Themselves, their face, what they're doing. And that flies in the face of Scripture. I'm not saying it's wrong to do those things and document memories. That's good. I, I support that. But it, it, it can come to a point where it's all about you. Nothing to do with anyone else. The world says, get yours, no matter the damage it might do to others. And I've come this morning to tell you that that is a lie and a trap of the devil. That, 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 that you can, can get your what you want, your, your happiness, find your peace. That's such a common phrase. But there is no peace in selfishness. It breeds instability and ultimately leads to ruin. It, it, it is a disgrace before God to be selfish. To put yourself before your brothers. When, when, when they're struggling and when they're battling, you turn your eye to that. And, and you go around and you focus about your need. It's selfishness. There's been far too many people that we all know who have struggled alone recently. We don't understand the consequences of what's happened in the last year and a half, and we won't for a long time. But all of the mental health problems that have arose from isolation and people that had no one there for them, and their thoughts begin to cloud, and their their decisions begin became fuzzy, and they didn't know what to do, and they turned the wrong voices. Many things in life were not intended for us to navigate alone. You're not supposed to process pain by burying it inside. You're supposed to release it and let brothers and sisters that are around you help you heal and help them minister to you. That is the, the plan that God intended. But we oftentimes don't support those that need it most. We all have phones. But how many texts do we send? Lifting up. Supporting. Encouraging. Asking how they're doing. Asking what's going on in their life. And I don't mean superficially. I mean it. really mean it. You can tell when people care. We don't send cards anymore. We don't have time to spend with our brothers. We can't even sit in the sanctuary for five minutes after church and have a conversation sometimes. Because we got to go. We got to go home and do our stuff. There's no sense of belonging or community. And, and even worse than doing nothing, we also can tear down others. Words of gossip. And division, they cut. Your words matter. Amen. And you get what you speak. If you sow words of division, it won't be long until you see that growing up in your life. So I would be very careful about what you speak over your family and what you speak over the children of God because God keeps good records and He knows what you, what you are planting and be assured that, that God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, you're going to reap in due season. Why don't we just clap our hands to the Lord the next... We exclude people who would love to be involved. We pass by so many hurting and broken people without even speaking to them. Or even looking at them. What do you see when you see someone in Walmart? Are you even looking? Are you looking at the pain that behind those eyes? 
the things that they've been through. They just need someone to care. We judge without full knowledge of what's going on in someone's life. And the irony is that we are great armchair quarterbacks in other people's lives, but oftentimes we can't even put those into practice, those suggestions or how we would have done it in our own life. We can't practice the advice that we give. And it ought not to be so in the church. We need encouragement. We need each other. We need a hand to help us up when we fall. We we need uh, sometimes someone just to sit there and listen to what we're going through. We need support. There is strength in numbers, and that is why God's design is so important. It's not just about the vertical dimension between God and I. It's also about the horizontal between myself and my brother and my sister. We cannot build upward spiritually without having a wide base at the bottom. And that's why in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six, when Jesus was asked, What is the great commandment? He said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. That's the vertical dimension. But the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love thy brother. Thou shalt love thy sister. Thou shalt love every stranger. No matter what they've done, no matter what they look like, no matter what they might have said or done to offend you, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you get those two, you don't need the other eight commandments. You won't have to worry about idols because you love the Lord with all your heart. You won't have to worry about coveting and stealing and killing because... You love your neighbor. Cain asked the question, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, am I responsible for my brother's well-being? Cain missed it. He missed it because God uses people to keep his kingdom. God uses people to keep his kingdom. We are His hands. We are His feet. We are the ones that are supposed to go into the highways and the byways and minister to the lost and minister to the broken. This is the vehicle. We are the vehicle that God has chosen to use. And and we don't even see ourselves that way many times. God uses us to show kindness. Show love. Give monetarily to lift up. But we have to be willing to do it. God's kingdom does not exist where these two commandments are not practiced. God's kingdom does not exist where people do not love Him and love their neighbor. If you're wondering why your life has felt empty for so long, maybe try this. Try, try loving others as you love yourself. Try first dealing with the vertical dimension or the relationship between you and God. Go before Him and ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Go before Him and ask you to help be in right relationship, right spirit, right attitude and mindset to receive from Him. And then after you do that, go to your brother and say, Brother, how can I serve you? How can I serve your needs? How can I minister to you? And and watch what God does when those two commandments are on display in your life. It's more difficult to love our brother as ourself because we see their flaws. We're critical of their flaws, but we're not as critical of our flaws. We see that they're not perfect. They have rough edges, issues. But at the same time, we can see the best intentions in our own hearts. But God is interested in how that we see others. Oh God, I would that we would be able to see how you see today. 
Give us eyes to see in the Spirit. Lord, the people that need us. God, give us eyes to see the hurting. Give us eyes that are attentive, that are looking for brokenness. That are looking for a a person that they can minister to day by day. Because everyone is broken. Everyone has issues. Everyone has scars and damage. The fields are white. But the laborers are so few. Can you see people with as much value as you see in yourself? Are you looking for others' needs? Or are you looking to serve your needs? How do we love someone? As I close, love is not free. True love is not cheap. It's not easy. Love involves investing time and energy. Love is not self-serving. It is not selfish. It does not seek its own. Love lifts up with kindness. It's edifying. It's affirming. It, it, It encourages and speaks life. Also, love seeks to understand it doesn't seek to know. It doesn't have, have a superior attitude or mindset, but it seeks to understand, to, 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 let, to let people speak and to hear and to listen, to hear what they need, their struggles, their battles. One of the greatest ministries that we need to develop in our lives is the, the ministry of listening. Ministry of listening. We like to dominate conversations. It's all about my life, what I'm doing, what I'm going through. But, but that, that, that's self-serving in nature to get yourself out there. But what if we listen? What if we listen to others' needs? What might God do if we listened to the people that we come into contact with? Jesus was the greatest love, example of love when he laid down his life for others. By doing that, he made others primary and himself secondary. He being Jesus must decrease or must increase and I must decrease. 1 John 4.20, as the musicians come, says, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he had seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Your love for God and your love for the, your brethren are connected. They're tied together. You can't have one without the other. And at the level that you love your brother, that will be the level that you love God. Construction is so much easier, or harder, excuse me, than demolition. It costs a lot more to build up than it does to tear down. Especially in the short term. It's not comfortable. It's not natural for our flesh to want to give and to give and to give and to give until nothing we feel is left. But that is what God has called us to do. And God rewards those that diligently seek Him. And to seek Him means that we seek our brothers. We would stand all across this place today. So many times we're chasing God's provision and demonstration in our lives. But God's provision and demonstration comes to you at the level that you love your brother. So all across this place this morning, I want us to think of three people that have a specific need that you know of, that have something wrong in their, maybe it's in their finances, or it could be in their 
their family, their emotions. It could be a health thing. Just think of three people. And I want us to gather around the front this morning. We're going we're gonna to spend this altar call interceding for others. Because that is the best investment you could ever make. So why don't you come right now, if you would. We're going to pray a prayer over ourselves, and then we're going to pray for these needs. And God is going to begin to move in our hearts. And He's going to give someone the revelation of how powerful others are. How powerful loving others is. All right, we're going to pray right now. We're going to pray over ourselves and ask God to reveal to us the ways that we can love our brothers more effectively and our sisters more effectively. In the name of Jesus Christ, God, I ask that you would give us a revelation of your love for us. And God, that we would turn that revelation of your love into a pure love for you and our brothers and sisters. God, help us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. God, help us to put others first. Give us the dimension, Lord Jesus, to put put what we want aside and to serve others. God, I pray for every heart, every mind right now in Jesus' name. Encourage them. Draw them closer to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name. All right, right now, I want you to just lift your hands and begin to intercede on behalf of of someone else. Begin to lift up their name. Begin to call their name before the throne of heaven. Begin to ask God, would you move in their need? God, would you move in their heart or their life? God, would you lift them up? Would you do a mighty work in them in the name of Jesus Christ? Oh